Hello and welcome everyone to this Australian Wool Innovation webinar. I'm your moderator, Kevin Wild. Joining us online for the next hour is AWI Chairman Jock Laurie. He's actually joining us by phone. Uh, thank you, technology. Fellow directors, Georgia Hack, Noel Henderson, Michelle Humphreys, Don McDonald and David Webster. James Morgan is an apology. This webinar is recorded and will be emailed to all those who registered. It will also be kept on wool.com. The format, of the format of the webinar is that we will go through the questions submitted online in the lead up to it, and also those questions submitted while we are on air. Um, first, Jock Laurie with some general comments before we go to questions. Jock. Uh, thank you, Kevin, and thank you to uh, everybody for coming on, and thank board members for being on. Um, James, as I said, does apologise. As Kevin said, he got called away to a, to a late work commitment. Um, we've... Uh, um, this is just a follow on from the webinars we've already had. Um, I think there's been a fair bit of stuff that's been happening in the wool industry space in the last uh, three to four months, uh, especially uh, in and around the up the land prices, cattle prices, and the general um, the confidence level that's sitting in the industry more broadly uh, across all of those sectors. Uh, the drivers sitting in the parts of Australia at the moment is also creating some, some pretty major issues and really causing a lot of. Uh, a lot of stress in people in the industry. One thing I can say is that we're very aware of that. Uh, many of us are living that at the moment, and so it makes it um, uh, far easier for us to understand the issue on how to deal with it. I think some of the stuff that um, uh, is possibly good around the wool industry, and certainly I saw it up here in 2019, you know, the good old-fashioned uh, marine enterprise was certainly the, uh, one of the easiest things that we could actually get through the drought on. Far easier to maintain, still productive through a drought, and got us out the other end, still holding sheep numbers fairly well, whereas a lot of our cattle enterprise have a pretty savage blow, and I think we saw that across Australia in those drought areas. But where we're going into, into those very dry times again at the moment, it is, um, I think the wool industry is in a very strong and positive space. Also, some work that was done by MLA just recently in regard to uh, how wool is uh, faring compared to the meat commodity prices is uh, very positive. So I think that the industry is in a... You know, reasonably good, reasonably solid position. We know that it's sick called everybody that's been in the game long enough knows that it's sick and called and uh and we will continue to deal with it. Uh, I think the board are also and the company's also very mindful of the major issues that are of concern to the industry. And a lot of those in and around shearing. Uh, and certainly the shearing space we've been investing quite heavily in uh shearer training and only just reading articles on the land today, which you know very much quoted around uh Willow was you know one of the quietest winners they've had in the shearing space for a while. Uh, I think as, as uh, you know, the work's getting done, the weather's been better and we've been able to get through. So I think the work that we're doing with training is certainly helping in that space. And obviously the work that we're doing in uh, biological harvesting, uh, I think is going to be very positive for all that take a bit of time. The company uh, understands just how important the industry new growers points them. And that on the basis that if we ever get into this position again, uh, we will have a shelf ready product uh, to go. So that's the aim of uh, aim of where the company is and we want to head down that path to continue to deliver that. On the demand side, obviously, uh, world economies are a little jittery and that's causing some problems. But the EMI has been uh, sort of gained a bit of ground in the last uh, the last week. And I think that, um, you know, there's some spot, the positive sign there. Uh, we do know that the natural fibre wool is in a, a very good space when it comes to uh, uh, what people want internationally now are really understanding, um, you know, impact on environments um, and uh, biodegradability and, and microfibers and all those sort of things. I think wool is in a very positive space and we are developing things to make sure that uh, people understand how uh, how we can fit right into that. And at the same time, we're also defending very much uh, wool on the international stage. So this, just in broad terms, that's where we're at. I might leave it there, Kevin, and then we can probably cover off with a fair few more things as we go through with uh, some questions. Great. Thank you. And it was remiss of me to not mention our CEO, John Roberts, who's, who's also on the call. So the, the first question is from Stuart Clement, uh, who wants to know what pathway does AWI intend taking for the problem of wool breakage, although we know it's a weakening at the uh, in regard to bioharvesting, um, what are we doing in terms of a cutting device or something else? Well, uh, so we had our field day at uh, Denny a couple of weeks ago. We had about 180 growers turn up, which was very good. And there's a lot of, uh, certainly a lot of interest in um, seeing the weakened fibre on the steep. And 
there was a lot of interest in staying at Harvested. Unfortunately, R and B being R and B, we didn't actually uh, have a very good day the day before when it came to Harvested. So we decided we did uh, would be better off not doing that, and we had a uh, video of it being Harvested, and, and there was a lot of interest in uh, in that. So we had a meeting, actually had a meeting today. We've been talking in family and we had another meeting today with our senior staff, making it absolutely clear and discussing with them that we need to uh, very proactively find a solution to this problem. We need to look domestically. We need to look internationally. And we don't want to be sitting back waiting for people to come to us. We want to be targeting people that we think uh, could actually operate in this space. Uh, I think all the directors uh, know that there are a lot of people that work uh, in sheep handling equipment and different things that, that have the potential to uh, have ideas in here, so we'll be approaching all of those. And there's also other directors that I spoke to last night that were clear that, you know, there are many people in an athlete that have very, very good minds that could put their mind to this that may have no um, uh, no interest in the wool industry at all. And I think the example was given by Noel that, you know, Elon Musk never knew too much about cars, but now we've got one of the biggest car manufacturers in the world because you've got the right people to do the right work to put them in that position. So uh, we have uh, been, um, we were very clear today in all of our meetings about the urgency of this, uh, the need to make sure that we provide choice to the growers of time, that we understand, uh, first of all, where the protein comes from, that we understand how long it's going to take to develop it, what APVMA approval means, um, uh, be pretty clear about the harvesting component and how we want to proactively uh, address that issue uh, and engage in that. And I think the company as a whole are uh, absolutely committed to that. And we understand the time pressures that are here. Now, I might leave it there and that some other directors might just want to comment on that. But um, I think we are very, very conscious of the issue and we are very focused on delivering something for the uh, for the industry. So if there are other directors that just want to comment on that, it'd be a good time to do so. No further comments. I, I would just say that we are organising a demonstration day at Katanning with the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development uh, at the end of October. Um, and when we can finalise the, the program, hopefully as early as next week, um, we will share it as will uh, the WA government. Thank you, James uh, Morgan, for joining us as well. One thing I'll, one thing I'll say, I'll make that in just a minute, if anybody knows anybody who's got a good idea, it's not only will we proactively go out, we still want people to come to us. There'll still be expressions of interest about people we don't even know about. There'll be engineers out there that have ideas. So, uh, honestly, I think the board are uh, very comfortable and very determined to uh, to address this issue. We need to be completely open minded about it. And uh, I think that just follows off from the remarks we've made. Great. Scott Byrne asks, how can we... Uh, AWI promote support Australian value adding to our products. Uh, this is a, uh, a a question that, in many ways, is um, multifaceted. So, from a company point of view, and I'll get George just to give a bit more detail on this in a minute. Uh, from a company point of view, um, value adding. Um, once we grow the wool and get the wool and bales to send it off to. Um, the brokers, the value adding from us can really start from there on. So what opportunities are there to do it, to produce the processing domestically? What um, opportunities are there for design? Uh, what are we doing to actually make sure that we are uh, promoting the fibre in that thing and driving demand? There's a whole range of things that I think that we're doing. Um, and I think it's the understanding of just exactly where value adding is and what it is, I think is, is a complex issue. So my hand to... Uh, Georgia, just to give a bit more detail around. Thanks, Jock. Yes, um, I think I think it's an interesting question. I think we're very we are very focused on on growing the the demand for wool globally, but then also um, I, I think re reviewing how we uh, talk to the Australian consumer in, in relation to wool as well. So um, from an eco campaign perspective, I think many of you would have seen our wear wool fossil fuel campaign last year that has been. Um, the most successful campaign that we have run in recent years in sort of garnering not only consumer consentment but also trade sentiment um, throughout throughout that campaign period. It ran from September to November last year and we actually reached over sort of 92 million people through video and the press clip clippings, which is sort of the media talking about the campaign, exceeded 
195 million. So I think the team um, and, and the internal marketing team have done a, a fantastic job there in terms of having wool top of mind. I guess when we look at the results of that campaign, we really look at the consumer after that campaign and, and do a post campaign analysis to understand the impact of that campaign. And 78% of consumers said that they would consider or, or look at their, uh, I guess, the fibre and fabric when making purchase decisions going forward. So that's a huge win for us, um, I think, going forward. I think another big one that uh, I guess focus is, is our retailer partnerships. And this allows us to get close to the customer um, through the retailer, whether it be through, uh, you know, the likes of Prada at the top end of the chain, uh, right through to Hudson's Bay, which is a, a well-known Canadian department store with, with significant reach within, within the Canada market, to Tmall in China, which is a, a, a big, um, you know, a, a significant, uh, has significant reach. So I think we're constantly looking at this kind of equity building campaign that, that promotes wool, um, you know, in, in that sort of environmental positioning, but then also the retailer partnership, which sells um, kilos of wool. And I know um, from the Timor campaign specifically, um, we were able to, to, to generate um, significant wool sales through that period. I think when we talk about value added within Australia specifically, we are working with Australian retailers, whether it be Sportscraft um, to promote wool throughout um, their stores nationally. And we also work with a number of local brands here to drive new product innovation as well. So um, we are very focused on obviously the global piece because we know that's where the market is, but then onshore as well, looking at, um, you know, I guess different sourcing opportunities as well. Thanks, Joe. We're also, Kevin, just on that, we're also working on wool producers, uh, looking to see whether there's any opportunities domestically for processing at some level. So there's a lot of work going on to try and find ways to add value to the clip, but I think value adding has a, you know, a range of different uh, different meanings. So I just suppose, you know, is the value in building demand, is the value in defending the fibre, is the value in uh, developing new product like the athleisure wear that's going on and some of the workwear stuff. So I think it's a, it just all depends exactly what you're talking about in that space. Yeah. I think we've dealt with it on, on a number of levels. Um, Andrew Wittenhall uh, is pessimistic. I think it's it's fair to say. I'll shorten his question because it's quite a long one. Um, but he he says, we as long-term wool growers, and I speak for other growers, uh, we're now considering to get out of wool growing due to labour shortage, musing issues, cost of running merino enterprise, and basically no one wants to crutch and shear merino sheep, especially weathers. Um, we can train as many people as you like, but they don't come back. So what do you say to that, which is to borrow from Q&A, we'll take that as a comment. So that is that um, uh, as the chairman of AWI, I will do nothing but speak the industry up. Uh, as a wool grower, uh, I have nothing but confidence in the industry that my family can make it. I know that there are difficult times in all sectors and you know, we run three or four different commodities on our plates and all sectors have their challenging time. Learning the shearing space has been a challenging time. We've invested heavily in doing that. I think the articles I just quoted a minute ago said there are, um, you know, shearers that have been uh, not working a bit lately and the price of shearing is coming down. Um, the work that we're doing with the uh, bioharvesting is about making sure that we can provide choices to growers. Um, the, the issue around mulesing is, is and always has been a very personal choice. It's the way you want to go utilising genetics. It's the way you want to go. It's not a parade of the idea. It's the way you want to go. That's where you can the market signals and the market information is coming back. Uh, but I will have absolute confidence uh, in the industry. Uh, if I didn't have, I wouldn't be here. And if I didn't have, I wouldn't be investing in the industry uh, as I have been. Um, I, I was going to get James Morgan to talk about this because he's uh, an internal optimist and, and lives in an area which is probably more remote than most wool growers in Australia. No, no, James, Jock, James has just joined us. Okay, so I'll get James and then Don, I might get you because you're heavily invested in the industry too from your point of view of a quick place. James? Yeah, thanks, Jock. Good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, look, uh, I, it's no secret that I'm a, a die, hard, die on the hard um, wool producer. I think... Um, Going forward, look, the, the cost of shearing, the cost of production, we're, we're all aware of that. And and when wool was at, you know, 
Um, when the EMI is high, it's much easier to cope with those high costs. And when it's lower like it is at the moment, of course, it's tough on growers. But of course, you know, at the same time, uh, meat values have dropped significantly right across the board. And um, I think, you know, in the ag industry, they're probably one of the, the few bright lights is, is grain growing. And, and that has its moments as well where it's up and down. So look, I, I'm I am an internal optimist. I think it'll um, but but it doesn't mean to say we don't have to resolve some problems with the the shearing industry, um, and uh, you know obviously continuously working at offshore marketing. Um, so I, I, I sympathise with all of those views, but um, I think there will always be a level of attrition in periods like this, which is disappointing for the industry. But conversely, people. Um, may may fall back into the industry, particularly if we can um, uh, add add an additional method of of extracting wool from harvesting from the sheep. But that that's that's for the medium term. But in the short term, um, I think wool will provide some really important income, particularly for people in the medium and low rainfall zones, or even in the high rainfall zones, of course. But um, particularly where we're a monoculture, the, the 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 wool will be really important over the next uh, period while meat prices are decimated. So uh, as much as the wool market looks pretty, you know, a bit flat, it's not, uh, it's certainly taken a, a, a pole position uh, in the last um, six months, given given where red meat's fallen. So look, I, uh, you know, I, I hear what the uh, the um, question questionnaire person asked or mentioned their comment, but, um, you know, I think people, people need to, uh, you know, stick with it and and it, it is a product that's got longevity um and it's certainly got global attraction from from the you know, fashion and and retail sector so uh, i'll hand over to you don uh, to your sort of ar arena of knowledge thanks james um look i understand the frustration that people um went through particularly uh 21 22 uh in most areas are very very wet seasons and we had circumstances that um, uh, we hope are not repeated. We had a pandemic. We had high degrees of absenteeism. We had state borders closed. We had national borders closed. And uh, we had um, feedlots putting a lot of pressure, lamb feedlots putting a lot of pressure. And we had a lot of wet weather. So if you wanted to design a crisis for shearing, that's how you do it. Mm -hmm. um, but what it's done, it's it's allowed the, uh, the the harvesting side of things, the training side of things, to really take stock of the situation and try and put their finger on um, a better way forward. Other than the the programs that we just talked about with you know, biological harvesting, we formed a national committee with all the state training organisations, uh, contractors, uh, West Australian contractors, the national association, the training organisations grower organisations, brokers, all coming to the one table. And we're starting to see a lot of um, good things come out of that. We uh, started a small campaign recently trying to attract uh, shearers from the UK whose um, shearing harvesting season is uh, the opposite to ours because the Kiwis are not coming back uh, in like they were before. Um, that's starting to bear fruit. Um, I saw some footage today of an AWI shearer in a shed at Yass uh, with three young Welsh shearers. Uh, and, and they're all confident that there's plenty of young blokes over there that want to come over here and, and sort of start filling that gap that we had before. We've identified where our peak pressure points are, uh, where we're not looking for thousands of people to fill a hole. We're just looking for hundreds. Um, and so we, we believe the pressure is off certainly in dry weather and going north from where I am in central west New South Wales, um, um, numbers are going to come under pressure with this dry weather. So I, I echo what James was saying. I thought it spoke volumes that uh, MLA would, would put a report out actually recommending that the merino sector of the sheep industry was the best place to be. It's something that we've believed for some time. And um, I... I think that the, the crossbred wool market is going to be tough um, going forward. And I really urge growers to look closely at their gross margins on their sheep enterprises, um, because the, as the MLA report said, um, 
You know, Marino, the Merino uh, Eastern Market indicator at the moment is about 12% below where it was 12 months ago. The Lamb indicator is about 40% below where it was. And I wouldn't want to put a n- number on the mutton indicator. It's just fallen off a cliff. So um, I think things are, uh, things are turning around, looking better. Um, uh, John Roberts, our CEO, is in China at the moment. He may have some, some positive lights to shine on uh, what we're going to see out of China in the coming months. But but it's starting to look like things are getting a bit better at the wool side of things. John, do you want to add something? Oh, look, I think, it, I think you know, coming back to the question, we've got to create hope. And I think um, it, it's very clear to me that whilst uh, the dial hasn't moved, we want it to move in terms of wool prices. Certainly wool's prospects longer term are, are good. And uh, certainly the Chinese commitment up here is, 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 has not, uh, you, uh, gone away at all they are um very committed to the fiber their their um expansion in processing up here has been phenomenal yeah we lost a few smaller processes um during covid but the bigger ones have got a lot bigger um and that the the rate of which machinery is being put in here is is significant and also consumer priorities in europe we already know that consumer priorities in europe are, are, are very much favored to a natural fiber um, although we have challenges, the, the general undertone is that they want a sustainable natural fibre. And that's becoming very, very true here in, in China as well. Um, our most recent campaigns in China have all been around, after after surveying the Chinese consumer market, have all been around a push towards more sustainability. And, and so I think ultimately we're, we're well geared for the future and we've just got to try and get that get that optimism out there in in, in the marketplace because i firmly believe it is a, a great opportunity for the fiber right now well you knew kevin is speak it uh, and and be very positive about it i think that's not only because we need to i think it's because we genuinely believe that i can assure the uh um assure andrew that uh there are a lot of wool rails on the board that really understand. Uh, they feel the pain of the ups and downs of the market. We really do understand it. We understand some things are important to us. And um, so it's not new to us. We are well aware of what's going on. But we also have great confidence in this uh, as a fibre. Uh, we have great confidence in the work that's being done. Uh, obviously, uh, there's stuff in around shearing. And I saw another thing today around shearing, around the shearing price that's coming off, uh, simply because the supply of shearers is starting to... To do. I think the important part now is for farmer groups to actually get out there and start defending the uh, start defending the industry and, and setting that sort of benchmark, that price benchmark again, so that they can get some sort of control over costs of steering in their tip. And I think that's the big challenge for the industry at the moment. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to turn now. There's a, uh, a few questions I'm going to sort of cluster together on uh, mulesing. Um, the first one is from the Humane Society International, asking how many simpler fly workshops have been held this year and are they making a difference in terms of reducing reliance on mulesing and how many more are planned going forward? Sure. Uh, yes, thanks, uh, Jock and Kevin. Um, we Simpler fly workshops are the first of the workshop series that uh, we're running out. We have had some online events prior to these actual workshops. We've had 17 Simpler fly workshops around the country so far. Most of those were held last year. Um, currently, there's a planning going on on the, the next rollout of dates and locations for those Simpler fly workshops. And, and following that, and what will be coming out very soon will be classify workshops, which is moving more into the, the breeding space for resistance to fly strike. Um, those have done the, the pilot um, programs and, and they, they will be rolling out soon. And then following that and work is being done piloting um, the, the next stage, which will be the stratify um, workshops, which will which are targeted um, specifically for um, growers who want to progress to a non-mules enterprise. So um, the, the target for this financial year 23-24 is 25 extension events. So that will cover um, both the uh, Simplify and the, the other programs. 
And in terms of um, making a difference, what difference these workshops are, are making, the, the Simplify um, workshops are aimed at, uh, have been aimed at um, strategic fly strike management plans for growers. Um, so what uh, the aim of that is, is to increase the awareness of, of growers on the inputs that they're using to optimise uh, fly strike protection of their sheep. So that's things, uh, for instance, like the strategic use of shearing, crutching, and the most efficient use of, of chemicals. Once we get into the classify and the stratify workshops, um, that will be more the breeding and then to the non mule side of things. So that will be that that's more targeted to to um, uh, to, to making a difference in those areas. Thanks, Michelle. There's a, a couple of other questions in this space. One from RSPCA Australia: What is AWI doing to promote the uptake of best? practice pain relief given that only eight percent of producers they say reported using both analgesic and anesthetic for the national producer survey in 2022 uh, we've been AWR continue to, to uh, provide market information to growers to make up their own mind uh, obviously any policy around where people want to go with that is entirely up to uh, the grower groups to, to formulate policy. It's certainly not the position of AWI to be able to do that. Uh, and, you know, we would encourage people, obviously, to use best practice. Um, I think the company has been quite forthright in, in saying that we encourage uh, producers to use best practice, but in the end, it's up to individual producers to make up their own mind what they want to do based on the information that we can give them. Great. Yeah. If, if I, I'd make a further comment on that. Um, yeah, this survey was done on people's practices in 2021, and that followed on from a previous survey we did in 2017. And the, the, the idea of having these surveys is so that we can firstly track the changes of behaviour, and this informs one of the reasons for that is to inform the sheep sustainability framework, um, but also to identify um, gaps and where we need to do more work to, to encourage best practice. Um, one of the encouraging things from the 2021 data um, in that 2022 report was that the um, pain management level for mulesing was 92%. And, and that was a huge increase from a survey 10 years earlier where it was just over 60% of people that mules their sheep used um, some sort of pain relief. Um, yes, it, it is... Um, it's disappointing that only 8% of respondents in that survey used both um, a local anaesthetic uh, plus an analgesic, which AWI has, has recommended as, as best practice. Um, and I suppose what we take home from that is um, we need to continually, you know, be getting the message out there. And that's what we've been endeavouring to do with articles in Beyond the Bale with fact sheets, with landmarking, you know, best practice guides. Um, we're promoting um, best practice in our um, fly workshops. Um, there's also, we're developing an online training module with this. Um, and we've also helped um, uh, other organisations like wool producers, sheep producers and Animal Health Australia develop their resources in this area. So yeah, more more work to be done, um, but we're yeah we're we're working on it. William Swales asks uh, if Australian producers as a whole do not adopt non mulesing techniques, what effect will it have on our Australian wool brand image? And secondly, if it does have an effect, what impact will it have on the wool price for Australian wool? Uh, look, I think we've just done a, a survey, Kevin, with John, maybe I'll or. We still might be able to touch on anyway. Uh, in the end, the market the market sends the clear signal. It, it sends the clear signals, and people will make a decision based on the market what they want to do. Now, uh, if we get to the stage where they're saying that everybody should adopt non mules, then that once again is a policy area that needs to be addressed with addressed by the uh, agri political organisations, by the organisations that represent growers. Uh, we'll do the research. We'll provide the market intelligence. But it's not up to us to to uh, do that. Uh, the survey that we had, um, uh, John, you might be able to be the best one to cover up on the results of that survey. 
um, that clearly show, you know, where that issue is set in amongst other issues in regard to the international markets. Sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> Look, I think um, the the survey certainly certainly illustrated that you know, yeah, mules in is is one one issue, uh, one topic. Uh, what was pretty clear from the survey work um, is is that going forward, the the term sustainability is um, is becoming the priority. Now, everyone has a different version of what sustainability means, and what was clear in the survey was that yes. Mulesing in some cases was 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 preferential, but it, it was often in many cases far and above more important to these people about their version of sustainability, whether that be um, a multitude of our on-farm practices that we don't have, what we possibly don't talk about or haven't spoken about in the past, um, which are actually in many cases a much bigger priority for a lot of our consumers and our, and our, and our end users. Um, so. Yes, it, it's it's important that we 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 continue to get that that good information, that accurate information out, so so growers can make informed decisions. In terms of the uh, what's happening in a price in a, from a price perspective, we saw premiums for, for some of those integrity schemes. At times, it comes and goes. Um, what's what's becoming very clear uh, from my perspective, getting back to that question, is you know, what what does it mean for Australia if um, going forward? I think that. Um, well, what's very clear from 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 our overseas offices is that uh, we need to talk about um, mulesing as part of an overall sustainability piece. Um, so many things that we talk about um, that we do on farm that we haven't actually been able to capture or talk about uh, and are really important. The, the 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 things like rotational grazing, minimal chemical use, native pasture, these sort of things are actually in many cases, a bigger priority for a lot of our consumers and things that we want to endeavour to capture through through traceability going forward. I think, uh, Kevin, just to follow up, the, the, the um, schemes that are in place for native can certainly promote non wool and do promote non wool wool. And as was said, there were premiums there and Don Brick and quoted the premiums and Knowles you know, right across the premiums in that space too. So there have been premiums, they do come and go all depending on the fire and a whole range of things. But um growers who are in the non space can certainly promote the non mule brand and do so. Uh, this is an issue about all board and the impact it's having on the industry. I think hard is a fine. I think once again the market defines uh, defines that. And if the market is sending a big number of premium the non mules then then the growers can make up their own mind about where they want to go with that. Noel, did you want to add if something to add... that? Um, so, Jock and, and Kevin, good evening, everyone. Um, I think Jock, Jock's nailed it. The, the market um, has been and still is determining um, whether a premium is, is applicable or not. And, and we've seen different schemes evolve over the last four or five years, both here and in New Zealand, um, where they're dealing with um, non-mules war. Um, the premiums vary, and I, I think they tend to vary um, it, as much to do with the micron uh, of the wool as what they do with the fact that it, it is it is non mulesed um, There are certainly some Europeans that are paying um, uh, substantial premiums, and yet there are others in the 18, 19 micron space that where the, the premium is, is is minimal and that's that's I think leading to some confusion and dissatisfaction with with growers. But the market will eventually uh, make its mind up if if there is a an increased demand for premium product, which means um, finer micron wools, then um, I, the, to some extent I think it'll it'll confuse the market even more uh, as to whether it is um, to do with non-mulesing, but um, certainly the Italian market is 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 red hot on on this subject, and and they say they have a view that they will only buy non-mules wool after 2025. But again, um, will they be able to get sufficient quantity to to uh, draw a line in the sand um, a, a, about that? Um, I think the 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 the, the question is going to remain open until China decides what they may or may not do uh, longer term. And uh, and again, that is the market uh, dictating 
um, uh, where where this will end. Thank you. Um, a question from Simon Cameron. Uh, what will the amalgamation with Woolclip mean? Uh, will, will, will we, as wool growers, be able to have automatic access to test and sales results? I'll, just, I'll get back to that in a second, Kevin. Just, just to follow up from Noel's comment, but I think it's exactly right in relation to the China. One of the things that we do is at, at the board, we get our overseas managers on on a regular basis and we ask them a whole range of questions about what they're seeing in their market. A constant question that we ask our Chinese managers is whether they're seeing uh, any indication uh, around the very issue that we've just been talking about uh, around around music, if there's any change in attitude or whatever. And we do it on a regular basis because we want to be informed uh, from the coal face as to whether there's any change that we need to be informing growers. The day that we get an indication there's a change, we'll be informing growers. We don't have any concerns about that. It's the reason we ask the question every six weeks. Um, so you can be assured we are uh, doing everything we can to, to monitor what's happening internationally. And we'll continue to do that and we'll continue to provide that uh, that information. Now, on the wool clip stuff, JR, you might just be able to uh, answer where this is up. Just on mute. Sorry, I'll try again. Um, look, in, 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 in answer to Simon's question, I think, you know, what, what does it mean? What will it mean? Um, amalgamating the, the wool QE specie and the wool clip E specie? Well, firstly, it'll mean it'll move to less confusion in the industry. I think it'll it'll actually it'll move to a more united approach to traceability, which I think most industry bodies are in furious agreement that we need to pursue. Um, and look, I think we've been really pleased um, to have some really good open cooperative dialogue with with AWEX over this. Uh, in addition to that, um, we've we've been lucky enough to work with AWTA. Uh, with the endorsement and support of uh, wool brokers, uh, National Council of Wool Selling Brokers and, and Australian Council of Wool Exporters, uh, and also you know, following on from the report that wool producers did, did on um, on traceability some some time ago, so there's a there's a I think it's to me well to to what we, we're of the opinion now that the 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 United E specie one E specie it, which is going to be endorsed by industry. Is going to be the first data point. It's going to be the start of the data journey, so wool growers can start to tell all their good stories, all the good work they're doing, uh, and 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 feed into a hopefully a, a, some form of Australian traceability hub, which these industry bodies are working on at the moment. Um, we're, we're we're pretty excited about the progress there, and we look forward to reporting on it. Um, will it mean that uh, I think the other part of Simon's question was, will it mean they'll be able to auto access their data? That. Uh, will, will, will the customers be able to auto access that data? That data, yes, test data will then be fed into a, a central data repository, uh, and and that'll have to be on a permission basis. Would be my, my first thought is that you know it, it's obviously there's privacy issues, and some growers want their their details um, made available, and others don't. And so that's but yes, the op the ability to do that would be there. But ultimately, uh, it'll, it'll be the grower's start, choice. Can I just yeah. ask you a question, uh, The um, data have you talking about? Give us some time frame here, that, please. Yeah, sure. So, look, I think just just a bit of background for 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 some of the the people who've dialed in. Um, we have a number of building blocks already existing in the industry. We have a we have the highly you know the world leading highly sophisticated testing house in the Australian Wool Testing Authority. Uh, we have. We have a, an e speci uh, which which uh, and which is being run by AWEX. We have a, a data repository hub, which in the form of WoolQ. Um, we have a number of other building blocks that already exist. We have the Weederpug data network within the industry, um, and it's a case of pulling all these together. Um, a lot of a lot of this front, this these building blocks are already there. Um, I think in the past there's been a bit of a disconnect between what was happening. There's now, I think, particularly after the foot and mouth scare last year, there's a, an absolute uh, agreed urgency around the need to have a, tra a traceability hub. So we can, firstly, in the case of a uh, incursion of, of, a, of an exotic disease, we can actually isolate um, affected bales and not shut the whole industry down, which is what would happen if we didn't. And secondly, uh, and I, one that probably interests me, or excites me more, is the, the, the ability for us to actually um, capture all the good on-farm practices as well as just your test data and your mulesing status, but so many other good things 
uh, in one spot and actually start to um, you know promote promote ourselves and tell our story. In terms of time frames, um, I'll be meeting with a number of the, the those industry bodies here this week in China. Um, we're hoping to have a conversation with WIA, Wool Industries Australia, about how we progress this as an industry. Um, and then uh, I'd like to think that we'd have some, something more concrete to, to, to show to industry by early next year. But, um, you know, I'm not going to put a, a line in the sand here and now, but certainly progress has been good. Great. Uh, a question from George Millington. How can AWI assist WA wool growers and indirectly all wool growers in opposing the live trade shutdown proposal? Uh, I can answer this one, one quite clearly, that the, um, uh, the live trade shutdown proposal is the government policy. Uh, AWI do not deal with industry policy decisions or do not engage in policy areas of government. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. One reason is that we're a research developed marketing company, not a policy body. And the second one is that when we uh, actually sign an agreement with the government to allow funding to come to the RDCs, in, of, of which AWI is one, it's made absolutely clear to us in that that we cannot um, be seen to be representing the industry on policy bodies, and we cannot speak against uh, government policy positions. Uh, we cannot take a political aspect in any area. So we sign an agreement that allows the flow of funds to the company that says that we won't engage in those things. And anything, any time we engage in those things, the breach of be a breach of that uh, statutory funding agreement. So we have an obligation, uh, quite clearly, around the things that we can and we can't do. Uh, dealing in policy areas, we can't do. There are farmer representative bodies uh, that do deal in this space. Uh, that specialise in dealing in this space, and there's a number of them across Australia, both in Western Australia uh, and uh, and the national bodies that have been active in this space and will continue to be active in this space. Uh, so, you know, unfortunately, I know that people have been disappointed with the RDCs that they haven't engaged in the area and being critical of the decision, but we simply can't. We simply can't. Our hands are uh, very clearly tied. Uh, it doesn't matter what our views are privately. That's uh, a completely different thing as a private individual grower, but as a company director of AWI, uh, our hands are tied, and that same thing applies to all of the RDCs in that space. Okay, thank you. Uh, question from K. E. Warner: Would AWI consider promoting a premium Australian ethical wool to support those in the industry who are doing? whatever the definition of ethical uh, wool growing is, depending on your point of view? Uh, who wants to answer this one? No, I'll have a go, John. Right. <laughs> um, there is, there, there, there are um, um, schemes existing now. Sustainable is one. It's uh, basically an Australian scheme that... Um, allows wool growers to promote um, ethical wool through sustainable green. Um, there are other integrity schemes, um, the international ones and the local ones. I think that um, the work that John was just talking about with the data hub is, is really going to be the piece that we can do where we allow uh, growers to um, populate um, the, the wool queue data hub with information about their own um, their own practices, their best practices, uh, schemes they're involved with, and and then create an environment where uh, downstream, um, whether they're processes or even brands, ultimately you'd like to see brands um, looking through that data hub trying to source the, 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 the ethical programs um, or regional programs or certain types of wool through that. So I think that's um, a piece of work we're very keen on. And I think that that will um, that that will sort of fill this gap. Could, could I just add one thing there? Um, I, I just think that um, you know, obviously, as AWI, we have to represent all wool growers, and I don't think we can be too prescriptive about what's ethical and what or what sustainable means. What we can do, as as Don says, is is illustrate what we do do on farm and capture that uh, digitally, and let and and let. Um, our brands and our customers determine what their version of sustainability or what their version of ethical means 
and then that that will allow wool growers who meet that that like criteria to actually to actually uh, showcase themselves. So yeah, that's probably all I want to add, add there. <clears throat> Any other comments on that? You got any comments, David? No, no, that's been well covered. Thank you, Chief. Uh, a question from David Lindsay. In New South Wales, will there be more training courses coming up in shearing? Um, I'll put up uh, after this webinar, both on our Twitter account and on our Facebook account, uh, the rollout for uh, to the end of the calendar year of uh, shearer training. Um, but... Uh, uh, Don or uh, Jock, do you want to comment on our overall well, commitment I'll, to shearer training? Uh, I'll comment on the fact that um, uh, there'll be training uh, nationally, not just in New South Wales. Uh, we have committed about 18 months ago, $10.5 million to training over a three-year period, uh, plus the money that was committed prior to that. Um, obviously, this, need, this training needs to go uh, right across Australia and has been right over in the West Australia and uh, David might just come and talk about some of the training that's happened over there, but we will continue the training in New South Wales, uh, <clears throat> which will be looking at demand. I think there are two aspects. One is to get the learners, and I think the last number was somewhere close to about 400 learners that we had kids in that were working full-time in the sheds at that stage. Uh, but it's also about going, uh, doing instead training, which is um, which is allowing quality and, and quantity to a certain extent to improve. But the other training that also goes on is um, around the shed hand space, and there's been lots of discussion around training around wool classes and lack of uh, uh, lack of decent wool classes out in many areas, especially in in Queensland's uh, an area that I've heard in uh, things. So we need to focus our training on where it's going. We do know the pressure's coming off the steering space a bit at the moment, uh, and that's being reflected in price. Uh, but we also know that the drain in the shed staff and passing staff. Is uh, is a very big issue at the moment, um, but I might get both David and uh, and Don to comment. Don certainly is through the the training stuff that's going on. He can deal with that. And David, you just might. I know it's a New South Wales related question, but the as far as I'm concerned, it's investment uh, nationally is critically important here because of the movement of shearers. You know, national training is a very important component. So um, you might just give us a bit of a background on Western Australia. Um, yeah, thanks, Chair. And I'll take us back to our third question tonight, which was Andrew, and I'm not sure what his geographic location was, but um, what's been felt across the country, and, and Don actually exemplified this in what he said earlier, for the last two years, that pressure, and I've got three families who were told, told me exactly what Andrew has told us, right? Uh, but that pressure I know from my family is eased considerably over the last two or three months. And it's been, there has been quite a flow of, New Zealand shear is coming in here, back in, uh, and the pressure is off. But however, the training, you know, we have to maintain a very high rate of training business. People will ask questions constantly of where are they? Now, one of the issues around this that we have to face up to is you look through the window of our industry and for a lot of kids and families, it's not that appealing. So that's been, we've had a major focus on standards around, around the whole industry in Australia that the standards in a lot of properties has been way below what's acceptable for people to work in. And that's that's been a real issue. So there's been a lot of focus on that. In terms of the training, our training here is delivering people. It's uh, But they don't all drop out. We are delivering people. We have to maintain that going into where we are with the biological shearing process. Now, that needs grower support. What I'm asking for here is growers, and it's very easy to be critical, and we all have been critical, and rightly so. But we need growers' support to carry this through. The next stage of all of this, it's the most encouraging that we've seen in my lifetime, uh, what's been tabled there now with the bio-fleecing. So I, what I would say to, to growers out there, support the company. Um, it needs your support. We've now got stuff on the table that looks very, very promising for the first time in their lives. On. Um, just, I'll be very quick. Um, in terms of training courses, uh, as Kevin said, he'll put details on the training courses, but, um, you know, the example that I mentioned this week where a shearing contractor got three young guys in from Wales 
and actually contacted AWI and within a couple of days had a trainer there on site working uh, in, in the shed, um, I, I think is, is, is gold really. And I, I think that there's in excess of 50 uh, contracted trainers in shearing and shed hands to AWI around Australia. So they're geographically placed in just about every region where there's sheep. Um, you know, if you've got um, a couple of people, you, you don't have to wait to an advertised school to actually get training to happen. It'll come to you. So just um, contact uh, Craig French um, and the company uh, and, you know, we'll come to you because I think that's that's really one of the best ways to do it in the, in the working environment with the rest of the team because whilst they're there training these young guys, they're also the other shearers that are there are getting training and the shed hands are getting training. So it's just making the whole environment work a lot better. Uh, I think it's really positive. And to contact Craig French, it's craig.french at wool.com. Um, nine minutes to seven here in, in New South Kevin, Wales. Kevin, Kevin yeah. can I just add something there, please? That Just to follow on from David, David and Don, I think, you know, the other really promising thing in all this is that we're seeing uh, professional wool growers take up the um, the uh, production uh, developments that are going on in the shearing shed, you know, the handling uh, facilities. Yeah. And also, um, you know, that they're, they're showing a lot of interest in the bio harvesting, but also in the areas Don's talking about with the training. And so I think we've got reason to be enthusiastic about the, uh, you know, about wool growers really wanting to take up this, uh, these improvements in, in the shed. I mean, we've seen quite a lot of new shearing sheds being built. We've visited, a couple of us directors visited some brand new shearing sheds the other day that have, you know, got all the new, you know, sloping um, catching pens and um, the raised boards and all the other new technical stuff that's available. So I think that's really promising for the industry. And, I, you know, and the AWI can continue to help out in that area. That's, that's part of our remit. So um, thanks for that. And I think on top of that, uh, the development of the modules, and I think the uh, in South Australia, I think they produced about 100 modules. There is a huge interest across Australia in the race delivery system and theory modules. And uh, I know there are quite a few manufacturers that are involved in that. So I think the industry, uh, I think the industry, um, the training and the bio harvesting and everything is all coming together. And I think in the end, it will deliver a very good outcome and a very good workplace for, for the industry to work in. Yeah, people are hungry for change, for sure. Yeah. Great. Uh, a couple of quick uh, questions uh, before we wrap up. Uh, one from Bill Ballard from the University of Melbourne. What is the influence of wild dogs on wool quality? Uh, I'm not sure whether there's been any research done on this, but um, uh, having been a landowner that's had dog attacks on people, I can tell you that that level of stress um, will most certainly impact Tensile strength, there's absolutely no doubt about that in my mind. Um, I don't think you can put livestock under stress like that without having an impact on on the health of the animal and that uh, impact on the health of the animal impact this whole thing. So uh, I don't think there's any doubt about that. I think it's one of the reasons that I have invested uh, substantial amounts of money uh, right across Australia in the in the dog space, certainly in a lot of dog fencing. Um, uh, there's been a huge amount of work done in that space to try and minimise the impact of wild dogs. Uh, and I don't think there's any doubt in many areas it has, but we do, we do also know that there are areas where there's still dogs are a problem. But I'm, I'm not sure somebody on the board might know if there's been any research to confirm any of this stuff. But uh, just from my point of view, having seen it happen, there's no doubt that it has an impact on things. Uh, no, no, no further comments. Uh, to... Well, we probably live with dogs the most in our region, uh, in the Western Division of New South Wales and South Australia, or have done in the past, and certainly improving in recent times. But the, uh, as as to the quality of the wool when when sheep are being stressed, I mean, clearly there is some effect, but probably the main the main damage is with losses uh, and, in, and 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 lambing lambing or not reproductive losses. So yeah, that's probably the key loss. But um, uh, look, I'll, we'll take that on board. I can certainly dig some information up on that, and if we can find it out, we'll get back to that uh, question. Uh, and give them an answer on it if there is indeed some information available. There's been a bit of quite a bit of research done on that area, so so yeah, we can get back to that. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, Kevin, just on that point, just to enlarge on what James has said there. 
certainly economically, it's catastrophic. Um, and West Australia is the best example of that that had around about 300 wool growing properties in partial areas. We now have two left that, uh, that are actually, you can say, are viable wool growing. So the impact of dogs economically is a complete disaster. We did fund a PhD. I funded a PhD on the stress factor on, on the families that were subjected to it, and it was much more um, impactful than we, we actually believed. It had serious impacts on them that came out of funding that PhD. So, but it's largely, you know, if you've got, you've got a dog problem, you're going to go out of business. Yeah. Um, we've got a, a live question from Mim Drinnan uh, about biological harvesting. Uh, one of the aims is to eliminate second cuts of wool. Who buys our locks? What are they used for? And will there will they be affected by no further production of locks due to biological harvesting? John would go out. Uh, I think I'll let John um, handle this one. Me, I think. Um, look, one of the things that we don't know yet about biological harvesting is. Um, you know, when you when you start removing the wool, how is it going to come off? Um, I still think, if I look at it logically, I think if the wool, there's a weak point in the fibre, there'll be a weak point in your fleece wool, there'll be a weak point in your bellies wool, there'll be a weak point in your pieces and your crutchings. Now, the ability to actually then move those those wools, those categories of wool, whether it be by air or by hand, um, those 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 categories will still exist in my mind. Uh, and we'll have to wait for more innovation in that space. But to me, we know that we've got to service customers. Those those wools are short wools. We can't put them. They need to be set. They need to be separated out just as they are now. So I would I would envisage any sort of um, when we do start engaging with engineers and 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 better minds than mine. I think one of the key things will be making sure that we still um, prepare our wool as well as we have now. It can't be compromised because uh, you know that's the. That's our great strength is we lead the world in terms of wool quality and wool preparation. Thank you. Karen Smith asks, and it, it may be something that we, we can't answer uh, directly, but uh, is there a framework outlining the proportion of our DNA uh, towards toward each wool growing area based on the value per kilo of wool exported? I can answer that pretty clearly and say no. I think there's a R and D, a lot of R and D investments. We do uh, R and D investments for the rest of the university uh, industry, industry picked up by the broader industry. Um, but we're not specifically targeting uh, any area on on projects. Most of our R and D projects will fit into multiple areas, and uh, and I think that's the way it probably should be. It's a bit hard to specifically target individual areas at the exclusion of others when you're when you're using sort of company funds to do that. Thank you. And uh, lucky last, and we, we we dealt with this broadly earlier um, in terms of consumer demand, but a specific question from Jamie Anderson wants to know the outlook for consumer demand in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, given the effects of the war in Ukraine. Uh, we'll get um, JR to answer that, but all, all I can say is that uh, so earlier on we have our a lot of our managers coming to our board meetings. There's a lot of positivity um, in our managers about opportunities in the market. Uh, once, you know, we get over the inflation, uh, inflation bubble, we get confidence back into the market, we get economy starting to grow again. I think you could say across the board, there is confidence that there's opportunities out there. On top of all the things that we've spoken about around sustainability and traceability and biodegradability and renewability, all that sort of stuff. But it's a matter of having economies, all the international economies, you know, China, America, Asia, uh, all the European countries getting up and getting going. Once you start to see that again, I think we're in a very strong position. Uh, John, you may have some more to add to that. Uh, yeah, sure. Look, I think there's no question that uh, rising oil prices as a result of the war in the Ukraine are having an impact on every every industry, uh, particularly a discretionary spend like fashion, you know, that's that's or, or sportswear. Uh, and and we've, we've, we're seeing the impacts of that right now. And we're seeing it right through the supply chain, no question. Uh, what I would say is that when things do improve, I think in terms of where wool sits, in terms of its eco-credentials and its its natural biodegradable status, it's a priority. The other thing that happens, and we are finding this in certain markets now, is that when when this does happen and, and, and 
cost of living goes up, a philosophy of buy once, buy well starts to kick in in a lot of markets. And that's where wool actually does, because it does last a long time. It is a high quality product, but it does last a long time. Uh, that that works in our favour. So some whilst it's uh, it, it is it is uh, there's a lot of apathy out there in our markets. We we are seeing signs that people are wanting to you know, move away from that fast fashion model, that um, that high turnover, low low cost unit, and actually just buy one thing and buy it well and make it last. So I think longer term, it, it, which actually puts us in a reasonably good position. And I think I'll just um, add to that briefly. I think the younger consumer, so anyone sort of sub 30 today, the, the sort of Gen Z consumer is a very purpose-led and purpose-driven consumer. So they will be, you know, the the, the lion's share of, of our market in, in sort of 10 years um, and they will will buy mainly on, on sustainability credentials. So I think we are well-placed in in the sort of medium to long term and, and um of course, we'll, we'll ride the wave in, in the short term. Thank you. Always good to end on a positive. Any concluding uh, comments, Jock? Uh, not at all. I think my only comments would be that, uh, you know, we really say to the industry, we remain positive. We've been through these cycles before. We've been through these economic circumstances internationally before. Uh, wool grain and the market is stacking up reasonably positive compared to other commodities. And I think we've been, the people in the wool grain government have known that for a long while. I think we're overcoming uh, some of the difficulties we've had in wool harvesting. We're looking at other options that are looking very positive. Uh, and I just think, um, you know, we we don't have to speak positive to the industry. We're speaking positive to the industry because we really believe it. Um, and we're seeing, we're getting lots of information. We really do feel there's great opportunities going ahead. Uh, and we really encourage people to take all those things into consideration whenever they're making decisions. We understand it's a very competitive marketplace for land use, uh, but I think the wool industry's been there for a long while. It's been there for a long while for, uh, for a reason. A lot of families have, have made a, a, a very good living out of it. So we, we just encourage people to, to uh, stick with the game. Uh, I know it's difficult times at times, but if you were producing a whole heap of goats or a whole heap of crossbred lands and you didn't have any feed at the moment, you would be feeling terribly good about that situation either so thank you uh i'll just finish up with that thanks to all the board members jr thanks to you kevin and thank you for everybody coming on and your questions uh, really appreciate it. thank you everyone have a good night